all the um the animals have a kind of overt psychology learning exploring emoting forming relationships and making different kinds of metabolic investments into promising types of behaviors but only a small subset of these walking gardens appear to exhibit that sexy cluster of traits that make us want to put a capital i on the word intelligence you know what I'm talking about, that special club that you might let chimps and dolphins into, but definitely not slugs, bugs, or most of the fishes. We, whoever that means, are currently aware of perhaps a dozen species of neuromobile organisms who demonstrate tool use, simple language, extended childhood, burial sites, personal emotional memory, I've heard the elephants never forget, but I'm sure it's all PR these days. And body image. Body image? Yes, body image. As in, does this octopus make me look fat? When I say body image, I'm referring to an MS-DOS that allows an animal's nervous system to map itself and its relationships in ways that afford increased creative leverage over its activities. That's pretty sweet. Wiggle the paw on the virtual homunculus and the real paw wiggles. Maybe now you'll get those treats the humans are always on about. The psychoanalytic funhouse term mirror phase has been used historically to designate a psychologically significant shift in the self-referencing style of the extended organism. By Frankensteining together a motley assemblage of sensory glimpses, partial reflections, and observations of others, or rather by assembling cooperative networks of the systems that do those mappings, some animals produce a de facto and somewhat unreliable representation of themselves that can be used to enhance control and coordination. The individual neuromobile agent now recognizes its own body as its own body in a mirror. I am this one or that one. Now, let us be appropriately cautious about ocular chauvinism. The mental notion of a mirror is peculiarly visual and should not be taken as license to rule out creatures that are predominantly acoustic, olfactory, or tactile as their primary neurosensory modality. It is not as easy for human beings to devise reflective tests in those other styles, but we must at least hold open space for the possibility. We do not know, in fact, how many of our animal cousins have located something analogous to this operating system, nor do we understand the full range of variants that might be possible. In addition to otters, crows, dolphins, big pigs, bonobos, and octopi, there may be quite a number of other species that reach this interesting phase shift in ways that are not immediately intuitive to our researchers. And importantly, it appears to be things like parenting styles and the arrangement of neural systems, their proportional mass relative to the rest of the body, rather than the existence of Paul McLean style levels of ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny or clumsy phrenological notions of sheer skull size that make these particular species stand out in this respect. For a variety of reasons, however, the rate of production of this type of self-recognizing, self-organizing system is relatively high among terrestrial primates. And among the primate species, there is one currently living lineage whose physiology, genetics, and extended childhood attains this mirror phrase, consciousness, in a highly dependable fashion and then continues its postnatal juvenile development through several more psychosocial phases whose normative adult set point has seemingly changed over millennia of socialization. While millions of years appear to have passed in which the adult human beings were largely similar in their activities to other mirror-phased animals, these slowly migrating omnivorous hominids, perhaps under the influence of certain dietary or ecological factors, discovered how to use gestural, vocal, and imagistic symbols to reorganize their nervous system, behavior, communication interests, and communities in a more abstract fashion.
Modern and postmodern human civilizations have a curiously quaint habit of selecting certain currently living lineages as iconic representatives of Aboriginal or Indigenous or Native culture. Usually, these are comparatively low-tech populations who happened to have been living somewhere before well-armed international literate and industrial culture arrived. Their visual resemblance to our historical notions of prehistorical humanity makes them a fertile screen for modern romantic psychosocial projections of alternative, and often healthier, modes of living. But who is it that we think they resemble? Archaic populations might truly be called the aboriginal first peoples, and not, I'm told, simply because they had great abs. The original abstractors were the inventors of humanity for hundreds of thousands of years. They seem to have lived a quasi-migratory campsite lifestyle in which the older members of extended families passed along verbal and symbolic lore around the campfire using oft-repeated trance-inducing song stories. Anyone today who goes camping into the wilderness without access to contemporary technology knows how magical, uncanny, and dreamlike it can be, with a weird and wonderful world of disorienting half-glimpsed and non-humans closely haunting the edges of the campsite. You might see anything suddenly appear in the hypnagogic arcanum of the woods, caves, and desert nights. Yet the lurking dream time of ancestors and animals, to which we succumb each night and in our inevitable deaths, operates alongside the very practical labors, crafts, and survival tactics of the camping team. Low-tech does not mean unsophisticated or unrealistic. The OG anthropotechnics are on display as the symbolically activated subsets of human animals converge upon the basic expressive capacities of the narrative consciousness. Skills that both change the world and make it easier for first wave humans to regenerate themselves. Art. Refined weaponry, ethics, apprenticeships, sign reading, ritual control of death, sex, and food, maps of the seasons, organized protection of uncontaminated resources, like water, water so unlikely to make you sick that we call it holy. These animals have fancy hands and talk with their heads, but to quote the talking heads, well, how did we get here? The sense of self, it seems, migrates from the body image to a socio-conceptual abstract referent, my name or else some analogy to the word I or even a specific gesture indicating the one that I am is more formal and flexible and fluid and fancy than my dimly shifting often incorrect sense of being this body. Human infants learn to negotiate within a few years both the establishment of a mirror phase self-mapping and a verbal conceptual self-mapping. Once we enter into the web of signifiers as one of them, we can participatorily deploy the power of signs to examine, record, and modify the world in a whole new set of ways. And, mind you, we're doing this mostly unconsciously, the way animals learn to swim or climb trees. It's a new kind of tree for the monkeys to climb, and perhaps not only the monkeys, but that remains to be seen or smelled or fondled. Myth and psychoanalytic speculation, always very reliable sources of information, apparently, describe this mostly forgotten and difficult passage from being an emotional agentic body to becoming a symbolic agent who unfolds, cares for, and has an emotive body. Freud's fascinating but narrow notions of the Oedipal tensions within the infant's understanding of the family structure was generalized by the notoriously arcane French theorist Jacques Lacan into an archetypal scheme describing our migration towards symbolic consciousness. A kind of triangular gate is imagined, the con joke, between the self-body, the caregiver environment, and the cultural other person who embodies the whole symbolic realm. 
The infant is looking to the mother environment who periodically looks to the father's system. A sense of desire and lack is established that orients the child beyond biological satisfactions toward an additional realm of meanings that promise some other kind of empowerment and food. An autobiographical journey begins in which one is among roles, not just creatures, and is perpetually passing from one promising symbol to yet another. Although satisfaction and justification are never finally attained by this carrot-and-stick self-narrating software, the transfer of biological drives into this more abstract desiring system affords many new capacities. The temporary use of justifications and endlessly incomplete satisfactions allows us to become novice hunter-gatherers in idea space, which in turn really ups our game in the meat space. The body image operating system is not destroyed, but like MS-DOS continuing beneath Microsoft Windows, it persists despite its enfoldment and utilization by the new layer of organizational tools. These human animals no longer simply know themselves as sentient organisms, but now they know that they are self-knowing subsets of sentient organisms, the Homo sapiens sapiens. We call them sapient beings to distinguish this new form of self-recognition, cunning, and artistry that makes them into predominantly technocultural and mimetic lineages. The autobiographical self begins its journey into the narrative terrain of justification systems that will stratify into a handful of relatively distinct modes of cultural psychology, which, if we like, we can retroactively argue is an example of a normative pathway leading to whatever general set of sociocognitive systems provides our sociocognitive system as a subset of itself, and which may then be amenable to certain further extensions and deepenings whose rough pattern can be sketched in advance in tandem with the cultural inculcation of the skills and practices that may make it more likely. And perhaps whole populations for hundreds of thousands of years came to adulthood in this so-called archaic mode of consciousness that today we associate with hypnosis, young children, and who knows, theta wave brain states. This is not merely reductive speculation. The amount of complexity and sophistication that might be possible with mature, lifelong exploration of this mentality could potentially harness powers of concentration, invention, and nonlinear intelligence that have not since been surpassed. I certainly doubt I can read the winds as well as they. Nonetheless, the pathway that human beings happen to have followed led eventually to another enveloping situation that may be analogous to the contemporary civilized shift from, say, the five-year-old to the ten-year-old. Theta wave dominance in the waking state gives way to alpha wave dominance, assuming the few studies on this subject turn out to be robust. And the clan dreamer starts to have notably more private fantasies of symbolic power, unique personal concerns about property and control, and a notable pattern of individual physical and social experimentation. They also get much more mobile and better at using tools. A variable subset of archaic people converged around the low-hanging fruit of a new psychosocial operating system that could be produced by complications and extensions of the wayback aboriginal system. The barbarian style was born. We call them barbarians out of respect, for today we appreciate the sweet shaggy stylings of the bearded and braided villagers much more exquisitely than it seems did our early kingdom armies who felt constantly menaced by and greedy for these outlander subcultures with their unpaved roads and meager mathematical and engineering skills. But that comes later. For now... At certain sites where religious festivals, the production of intoxicants, trade route junctions, or new small-scale planting and animal capture were occurring successfully, there was an urge to break with ancient repeated cyclic customs and instead establish permanent large villages. With the immediate production of 
private property in personal and family dwellings, and a semi-professional excursionary force, the Horde, that made exploratory expeditions to cooperate and confederate with and or aggress against the other tribes, especially if the locations of their villages were known. Villager horde communities identified themselves in distinction from other villager horde communities by a series of special human and animal totems embodied in power legends and depicting their new sense of verticality in which some legendary creatures stood above, looked down upon, and even absorbed others. Specialization of tasks became more pronounced in this new setting and this new style of settlement. Circulating power structures seemed to emerge in more politically explicit networks, featuring commonly a warrior chief, a cabal of matriarchs, and an uncanny and unsettling role for the professional shaman. Larger regional territories were unveiled before human vision as they were unveiled within human vision by an expanded symbolic terrain of consciousness. But let us not be too hasty here, for it is precisely, in some sense, the very meaning of expanded that is at stake in today's discourse around developmental stage theories. A new kind of mapping seems to have extended over more terrain. Rather than the view from the campsite, we now find the view from the top of the totem pole or the top of the local mountain, which surveys the entire region and imagines itself uniquely glorified relative to the several villages it can see from up there. Oakley dokley, but are there ways in which this is also not an expansion? Are we undervaluing the intuitive mapping systems of the pre-villagers? Does this one form of increase possibly come at the expense of a sensitivity to and a practice of deeper complex perceptions in other areas of life? Does the village blacksmith with his larger range of tool production see the nature of stone and mineral less richly than his ancestors? Has the viability of the social scene in some sense decreased as it has succumbed to hierarchical politics and institutionalized tribalism? We are telling a stage like history, but we must recall that it is not only only one history, but also that history hides many subtle losses even as it trumpets a few successes. We must work to keep our sense open. But nonetheless, these barbarians stumbled upon or brilliantly invented a powerful new set of sanctified calendars of the holy year, revolving like the wheel of a newly invented cart around the solar cults, whose power, though, was limited by inhuman and titanic potencies that required that the humanoid day cults band together in a pantheon to protect and profit themselves against their rivals and ancestors. The legend now tells of how the humans arose through battle and cunning and how they escaped from something. How easy that is to believe in any modern film in which a small cluster of human forging symbolic family relationships like Odin's blood brotherhood with Loki are able to deploy inventiveness, mobility, and directed emotional discharge to overcome velociraptors, giant apes, tricky sharks, and half-glimpsed many tentacled images of the natural logic of ecosystems. The gang has been invented, along with several stunning schemes for moving giant rocks, and however many attempts it took to figure out which animals we could ride and which ones we could enter into mutual taming contracts with. A new plunder economy came into being. Whatever the village captured, either from domesticated or undomesticated nature or from other villages, was redistributed according to a scheme of public status based largely upon the awe invoked by directed emotional muscular performances. The bellowing chief, the wild berserker, the ferocious grandmother, the brazen young hunter, the incomprehensible dance of the mystic. These forms of communication, still present today among people who get very upset, are demands for the status that determines control over resource distribution. We might casually say that might makes right here, but that's only part of the story. Might is very difficult to determine. 
Any two beta males can take out any alpha male any day of the week. So status has its roots in something other than a real overpowering capacity between individuals. It is based, at least here in the early large villages and hordes, on something more varied and more easy to determine, namely the performance of might. Intensity of display is here, just as it is in the pre-combat realm of the lobsters, the primary form of status conversation involved in the collective intelligence protocol of the group. The gang takes physical strength into account, but it also accounts for loudness, wildness, sexiness, ferocity, unreasonableness, mind-blowingness, spectacular dance, stunts, and ordeals. Perhaps coolness has not been invented yet, but whoever can get really hot has a good chance at a better chunk of the mammoth, which he or she will not eat alone, but will get to decide who it is shared with. But mo cognition, mo problems. It's not hard to see that this new system has many potential failure modes. Anyone who has been traumatized by the local private property dominance displays and aggressively deployed emotional polarization of a drunken parent can understand that this form of socio-cognitive operating system has the potential to wreck many things upon which it depends. Intertribal conflict begets slavery, vendetta, intergenerational pathology, insensitivity, child abuse, the list goes on. And these emergent problems couple with the periodic extension of the emergent capacities to open up the possibility for periodic and experimental mutation into other modes of organization that only have so many ways in which they can restabilize. So how long will it be before the expanding vision of shamans, the intertribal explorations of the hordes and traders, the capacity of a great war chief to defeat several other villages and take them as slaves, a few lucky harvests or some innovative schemes for domestication boats and wells catalyze with each other within a few subsets of the barbarians into a burgeoning metatribal consciousness with really big villages and the ability to move we move rocks. The last 8,000 years, and perhaps once or twice before that, has been predominantly organized by the hierarchical, scribal, and mythological consciousness of rival ethnic kingdoms or nations. It is not difficult to imagine how this cultural operating system arose from among the old tribes. The periodic appearance of intertribal dominators produces a situation in which one tribe has more plundered resources, large numbers of slaves, and new administrative duties, among other complications that they must now organize in their minds and social habits lest they collapse. The periodic appearance of potent thriving villages, whether arising from lucky natural conditions, intersecting trade routes, or through the establishment of more cunning plumbing, sets up a similar inequity. The today all too familiar situation between large villages, cities, and small villages, rural townships, was frequently restabilized as a city state kingdom. The relationship between dominant and enslaved tribes becomes an hereditary caste system, and the privilege of not being attacked by the dominant large villages is maintained by regular tithing or taxation, which in turn funds defense, mass building projects, and roads that enforce the notion that the agricultural or large resource base of the countryside or the ocean is unified with the big cities. City-states capture tribal horde attacks by converting their looting into regular payments and privileges in exchange for warding off attacks by other hordes, resulting in a professional militia that gives rise to armies and police. And the bright young shamans are captured into the system and become official bureaucratically established and literate priests and priestesses. A certain amount of self-sacrificial sadomasochism is built into this scheme, as many people from many different tribes are gathered into artificial living conditions with strangers who they are expected to treat as the same as us through official mass symbolic unification. 
The need to overcome the social unease of the masses, the need to make peace with obedience to distant, unrelated powers, and the need to publicly, though not always privately, break with the totems and customs of the tribe, means that a certain mood of agitation haunts the folk. And the common solution to this psychic tension is the cultivated assertion of a sacrificial willingness in regard to the arbitrary symbols and hierarchies of the Metatribe. Today, we call this patriotism in all its beautiful and terrible forms. Within the home, the children are threatened with real or implied violence if they do not suppress the expression of local instincts in favor of verbal and behavioral submission to the largely unjustified, i.e. justified by power, symbolic authority figures and official meta-legends or myths of our people. This new forced and self-forced sameness is organized around the one book, the one king, the one religion, the one language, the one official story. Different castes are united in a common mythic membership, and they exaggerate the role of loyalty through verbal confessions of belief and a shared willingness to sacrifice for the official theatrical and bureaucratic symbols of the creators of the folk. This also constitutes a kind of breeding program that cultivates over time a distinct linguistic, cultural, and visual type that we inherit today as races and ethnicities. Official decree, hereditary role-playing, and the option of gaining magical legal status from a superior rank in the Great Pyramid of Society become essential cultural currencies. The magical practices of the tribes are declared to be subservient to the legalistic supermagic of the one power and its one unsurpassable code. Time itself is dated from the symbolic founding of the people, the book, or the land. Thus, a particular multi-millennial segment, a journey from a creation to an apocalypse, is viscerally understood. The great year now lasts several thousand years, and then as prophesized, collapses. Bigger realms, longer durations, urban living, the city-country divide, political correctness, i.e. official respect-based status fads of courtly language, trade and war with rival ethnic kingdoms, all these co-arise with a form of experiential cognition that understands the events of the world to be organized by an invisible but still fairly concrete abstract order embodying the efficacy of arbitrarily mass-asserted symbols. This mode is not purely irrational, but it also does not privilege evidence over loyalty declarations. And it treats official sanction and widespread folklore as a source of information co-majestic with personally observed facts. What will later be called hypocrisy is not herein perceived, as one declaration of loyalty to the team and denigration of rivals is not felt to be in contradiction to another such declaration that merely happens to have opposite factual content. The ongoing presence of this system is a source of much vexation, puzzlement, and humor in contemporary political conversations. So the vast countryside and large rural villages exhibit patriotic willingness to express repetitive lameness and to undergo pain, obedience, and death in the service of the public cartoons as ordered by the military bureaucratic theatrical big city elites who are heredity-obsessed oligarchs confined to a shared ethnic identity and fronted by a performative monarch or leader who purports to have divine sanction from the author of the one book and or from the love of the people who require him or her in order for the greater land to thrive through obedience. After all, we got to support the team. So it should be obvious that this system sources a number of serious problems in terms of efficacy, consistency, sanity, happiness, and human health. 
In addition to its virtues and powers, it is also a mass production scheme for institutional abuse, broken hearts, furious private subcultures, normalized torture, normalized slavery, constant interracial and intergender strife, promotion based on heredity and official status rather than capacity, and brutal domination by entrenched oligarchs. Thus, the combination of these problems in both their normal and extreme forms combines with the social and cognitive and affective opportunities afforded to a subset of these people who keep stumbling across a whole new frontier of opportunities, architectures, and investigations. You can only rationalize for so long before two rationalizations collide into reasoning. Prophets of the Axial Age laid down their axes and taught a fairly reasonable super-abstract religious formalism that exceeded the traditional divisions between sects, nations, and kingdoms. From multilingual Buddhism to Socratic supra-Athenian dialogue to the Christ character suggesting that one of the god-awful Samaritans might be holier than your own family, race, or local sectarian co-believers, religious internationalism was on the march. And it was not terribly different than communism or capitalism on the march. The rise of metakingdoms or empires has a consistent flavor over the centuries, which is at least circumstantial evidence for a shared collective and emotional sensibility that is frequently rediscovered from out of the subsets of various ethnocentric hereditary symbolic kingdom cultures. There is or seems to be some kind of convergent cultural evolution predisposing and benefiting from a particular organizing of the neural processes and social habits, and perhaps even changes to the gut bacteria and breathing style. That highly dubious, wildly inspiring cad Julian James says it's only been a few thousand years since our brain hemispheres were interlinked enough to perceive thoughts and images as the results of our own thinking processes. And who knows? Who knows whether a few thousand years ago people, or even today a lot of them, do have the same exact neurotransmitter balances that seem to characterize the modernists and imperialists and individualists. The graves of our ancestors do not show us whether or not they had 0.01% more DMT in their brains. At any rate, slower than the speed of light in a vacuum, there were these individual humans whose egoic self-awareness became sort of professionalized and who did a lot of independent self-checking, cross-referencing, game-playing, reading, calculating, and even empathizing with people from other cultures. They started to care less and less about who your parents were, and more and more about who could get the job done. And like any smart adolescent sci-fi fan raised in a fundamentalist household, they were frequently pissed off at getting what they called constantly lied to and interfered with. Normal kingdom habits, especially in the household, were like a suffocating lead blanket placed on them by people who purported to love them. Over time, these folks made all the moves they could make, often becoming the OG Illuminati by gathering in secret clubs and networks of letter-writing codesters who proposed the rational overthrowing of the monarchies and religions in favor of humanistic transcendence, free thinking, and for some reason, banks. And although they were often publicly persecuted and killed, unless hiding in a satiric fraternity, they seemed to have much in common with a new breed of literate emperor who used megacities to launch technological reforms, new laws, vaster trade routes, hospitals and banks, and the integration of multi-ethnic populations. Frequently, these new meta-kings, if they didn't get Caesared on the Senate floor by racist hereditary oligarchs, were internationally literate and close friends with engineers, scholars, and free-thinking strategists who honored paper contracts over customary obedience. Ancient lineages of ethnic kings were forced to become vassals and client states of these new super civilizations in Mesoamerica, Rome, China, and eventually North Europe and North America. 
Networks of poets, mathematicians, writers, astronomers, inventors, explorers, engineers, and argumentative individuals sprang up temporarily around Athens, in the Mayan temples, in the court of the first emperor, in the Buddhist colleges, and the Sufi hospitals. The list is not exhaustive, but it is incomplete also in another sense. These fluctuating waves of proto-modernity in their diverse styles did not securely anchor themselves as a persistent international and technological way of life for the whole planet. That is because their inner access to this new operating system of individual exploratory double-checking and binary mechanistic dynamics lacked sufficient external supports to regenerate and accelerate its own hegemony. What seems to have happened in the particular lineages that we draw from today is that the printing press, i.e. literacy, mass education, paper money, and legalism, the craft of lens making, i.e. telescopes, microscopes, and high quality promulgated mirrors, and the formalization of the scientific method allowed this form of consciousness to replicate, self-empower, and mutate at a dizzying and racing rate unseen in its other emergences historically. Within only a few centuries, a handful of machine-powered trading empires spilled out of Europe, colonized the entire planet, remapped the world into nation-states, set up constantly changing technological life everywhere, cured many ancient maladies, and unleashed the greatest genocides in history. The rise and hegemony of this liberal system of professional, international, literate, investment-driven, neo-bureaucratic, mass-mediated, partisan representationalism, with its simple metrics of success that favor tactical game players who self-insulate from the consequences of their decisions, is almost unthinkably radical, and despite its many laudable innovations, it seems to be currently threatening civilization and climate stability. Its approach to communication is ambivalent, i.e. takes advantage of apparent opposites in a single system, and is as radical as one can imagine. Here is both the realm of scientific reasoning, that is to say the conforming of speech to fact and research, arguably the first intellectually honest procedure in human history, although intellectual honesty is not the same as authenticity, and at the same time, it also was a rampant culture of black magic, in which marketing, propaganda, advertising algorithms, and public messaging infiltrate every aspect of human life in a constant multipolar information war to manipulate our values, behaviors, and beliefs about reality. Neither honesty nor deception has ever had so much power as it does now. Not a paradox, but a deep ambiguity that we have to feel into and get straight about. You see, modernity cannot be simplistically lauded or condemned. It has saved more people and killed more people than any other known world system. It has cured and caused diseases. It enables prosperity and forces economic crashes. It has overcome and implemented inequalities. It tells the truth and lies at an industrial scale. It promotes individualism and enforces groupthink. It disposes old oligarchies and invents new oligarchies. Many forms of well-being have increased for many people, but we now suffer the rampant physical and emotional disease of a completely artificial mode of life that is wrecking everything we care about and doing it faster and faster. Who could make an objective evaluation of such a system? It appears to be everything and its opposite, and why not? Is it not predicated upon the discovery of a new cognitive frontier that consists of institutionalized opposites? The modern consciousness has learned the inner back and forth of the debate club, the ethical expectation of a prosecutor-defender argument, the political balance of a left and right, the electrical possibilities of a connected positive and negative terminal, the strategic utility of divide and conquer, the binary logic of circuits, the economic religion of supply and demand, the many variants of socialism, capitalism, the public-private divide, the endlessly two-option commercial carnival of mainstream media. 
The perpetual motion machine of weight and counterweight. Create or discover an imbalance, a need, a disaster, a resource in the wrong place, and establish an institutionalized scheme for skimming off the profits of the oppositional rebalancing process. Anyone can do it. Male or female, black or white, large or small, conventional or unconventional. Just think positive, learn the books, game the system, and take your homo economicus show on the road. There is a lot of certain kinds of liberty, but at the same time, modernists don't make good neighbors. Sure, they're more civil and tolerant up front than many of the folk, but they force their tactics upon you with little regard for the reason of anything that preceded them and a queer blindness to externalities and the long-range effects of their own processes and an institutional arrogance that treats short-term profit and PR as superior to the complaints of any other group. What Piaget called formal operational cognition is a huge leap beyond the range and abstraction of its predecessor, and it couples, when possible, with new methodological procedures, scientific, corporate, investment-like, constitutional monarchy, new devices, lenses, printing presses, clocks, and a new mood, international, reasonable, and professional. Well, it is possible that all systems, like all plants, have a mode of decay and obsolescence. We who live under the hegemon of modernity must, as have the radical thinkers of the last few centuries, pay special attention to the modern failure modes and their insidious seedlings. Here are some things that happen very frequently in this operating system. The difficult struggle to establish modern freedoms out of pre-modern societies of control produces traumatized moderns that are instinctively hostile toward the ethnic, religious, mythical world and labor psychology. Hardline atheists, metropolitan elites vaguely disgusted with deplorables, a willingness to sacrifice farming and fishing families to more efficient international corporate production, a quasi-intentional war of undermining its predecessor results in a plague of toxic antipathy toward pre-modern lifestyles and communication patterns, resulting, of course, in periodically resurgent angry pre-modernist advocates. The instrumentalist psychology of progressive tool makers has a momentum of its own, which produces items and methods that are as destructive as they are benevolent. Thus, the world, for all its benefits, fills up with processes of mass destruction. The system of balancing forces against each other in legislative politics slowly drifts towards stalemate as people discover the full range of hacks. Representational democracy is endlessly tempted to address problems by shifts in representation rather than changing the actual phenomenon and its productive dynamics. The same logic and freedom that opens up the entrepreneurial revolution will drift unless checked towards structures in which compensation starts to narrow progress, exclude new industries, and incentivize the conspiring of groups of game players to influence the game rules, even the well-lauded liberal constitutions, to benefit themselves at the expense of other and future players, incentivizing mass corruption, distortion, and interference. Since the initial setup of the modern system occurred through the use of many kingdom folk, it retains a need, unless it can innovate its way to the robots, for many believers and workers who provide predictable consumer bases, manipulable team sports voting patterns, loyalist bureaucrats for state and business alike. This need, combined with insufficiencies in our understanding of human learning processes, becomes a graded educational factory for producing pre-modernists with nominal modernist belief claims and minimal industrial survival skills. Modern reproduces traumatized and distorted versions of its predecessor and undermines itself. 
The inability of modern systems to see, feel, and profit from the internalizing of negative externalities of their practices means an increasing accumulation of pollution, toxicity, malnourishment, artificial life patterns, and the production of denigration, stress, and regression in people, as well as an accumulating meaning crisis. The combination of these factors means that modernity at an unprecedented scale and tempo will constantly sabotage itself, mutually destabilize its subfunctions, and undermine the preconditions of its own life world. Accumulative diseases, pollutions, dangers, and recurring crashes will either produce regress to pre-modern consciousness, or become folded back into an emergency profit-making scenario, which will also predispose crashes, or else it will get a local upgrade to a more postmodern system. How many times does that have to happen before people start to see and discuss the structural problems and the recurrent direction of the solutions, and therefore get forced forward into another operating system altogether? Next time. Pluralism, integralism, and the end zone of the narrative modes of consciousness.